Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming tonight. I know there's a lot going on in town tonight, and I appreciate you being here very much. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about uh, a radio show that I've been doing for six years in Bozeman called the Montana Medicine Show. It does air here in Helena. I'm curious whether anybody has heard the show before. OK, great. I'm going to play a sample uh, of the radio show, but then I'm going to read some scripts from the show as well. And the concept of the show is essentially that um, Montana history would be entertaining and in a short snippet delivered to the public in a easily digestible form. So uh, if you know the program Christy the Wordsmith, which airs all over the country, uh, that also originated at KJLT in Bozeman. And this show is sort of modeled on Christy, only the idea is let's tell a Montana history story in about two minutes. I want to say thanks to the Historical Society first for letting me be here. Um, there's been so many people here that have been friends over the years and that have inspired me in terms of focusing on Montana history. And their work is really what's informing the information that I'm going to share with you tonight. Um, and uh, so it's, I'm almost, I have a little fear and trepidation being in these hallowed halls because there's such incredibly talented people that work here and that have done work over the years. And uh, their work has inspired me immensely. Um, KGLT is the radio station in Bozeman that, uh, that uh, airs this show. But we also now are here in Helena, and it's just been picked up by public radio in Billings and Missoula. So within the next year or so, we'll probably see the Montana Medicine Show covering most of the state, which is uh, really uh, um, something that I'm pleased about very much. Um, the show, the radio show, is funded by a number of different entities. Uh, and over the years, we've, we've gone here and there to get money. Um, and I just want to thank these fine folks for helping us out. Humanities Montana, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Greater Montana Foundation, and the Guildhausen Family Foundation. Um, I thought it might be fun for us to start with a Helena-focused piece. Uh, and I just want to give you, hi, Tom. I just want to give you a sense of um, what uh, the radio show sounds like. And then hopefully you can kind of imagine that or hear that as I'm reading these scripts to you tonight. So uh, the first clip is, uh, that I want to play for you is of the uh, radio sh of uh, the Helena earthquake of 1935. And this is just a, one sample of about 250 or 300 scripts that have been written so far. Welcome to the Montana Medicine Show. I'm Derek Strong. On an October night in 1935, a severe 6.2 Richter scale earthquake slammed Montana's capital city. Resident Gil Alexander wrote, violently, uncontrollably, Helena rocked with the shuddering earth. The ground rolled like waves. Bricks and mortar fell. Buildings swayed. Roofs fell in. Businessman Fred Buck recalled, it was like being jostled about like a lone marble in a tomato can. Old Mother Earth reminded me of a dog full of fleas Thank shaking you. himself to get rid of the dirt. A Bozeman paper wrote the capital is now simply called Lena because the quake shook the hell out of it. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, just as people started to rebuild, another massive tremor hit. Historian C.R. Anderson wrote, People jumped to places of safety and waited the end, but instead the trembling increased. The violence became terrific. Walls crashed, which had been weakened by so many previous shakes. More than 1,200 aftershocks hit Helena in the next few months. The quakes killed four, injured dozens, and destroyed some 300 buildings. The Boston Post reported, Living there must be a nightmare. One can get used to just about anything except the solid earth shaking constantly. Only the pioneering spirit of the early founders that is still retained by the present generation keeps the city from becoming a wilderness. If congressional medals of honor were given to groups for outstanding courage, this community would deserve one. From KGLT Studios, I'm Derek Strong. So that's the gist of it. It's a two-minute story about Montana history. And uh, the challenge for me in, uh, in embarking upon this program was trying to, uh, to just 
not write very much. It's so much easier to write a lot than it is to write very succinctly. And to try and tell a story, and it's actually about a, a minute 36 seconds that I have to sort of relate some story, is really a challenge and something that caused me to completely rethink how I write history and, and what's important in history and so forth. Um, so what I want to do tonight is share with you some uh, examples of all of this and give you a sense of, uh, of what I've been up to. And my hope is that, um, my hope I guess is that you will not only be entertained, which is really the fundamental point of the, the show, but also that um, maybe by connecting the dots uh, in these 16 pieces that I'm going to share for you tonight, you can get a bird's eye view of Montana that's, that's uh, maybe the, 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 the whole is somehow greater than the sum of the parts, if that makes any sense. So what I'm hoping to do tonight is uh, just sort of march through time. And I decided the radio show emphasizes people, places, and things. And it's uh, going back as far as possible and all the way up. I think the most recent piece I've done is uh, 2009. So um, it's uh, primarily 19th century, 20th century. But uh, what I'm trying to do tonight, I guess, is just give you uh, uh, an overview of Montana history through 16 people. And I don't intend for this to be comprehensive or detailed in any way. I'm just hoping that you'll be entertained. Okay. So here we go. Um, I actually learned about this woman, uh, brown weasel woman, also known as Runny Eagle, uh, by stumbling upon this work of art, which I just thought was beautiful and interesting. It's uh, a contemporary Native American artist by the name of uh, Terence Gardepi that uh, created this work. And I, I just, I was struck by it so much that I decided to sort of investigate who the woman was and to learn a little bit more about her. So this first piece is called uh, Running Eagle. Brown Weasel Woman, later known as Running Eagle, was the Joan of Arc of the Blackfeet people. Born about 1820, she soon expressed a dislike for traditional female duties. Her father, a noted warrior, raised her as a Ninawaki, or manly-hearted woman. According to Professor Lisa Aldred, they were characterized by assertiveness, independence, property ownership, and leadership. The ideal Blackfoot woman of the early 19th century was quiet, submissive, and private. But Brown Weasel Woman preferred killing buffalo and single-handedly stealing horses. In an act of great bravery, she saved her father from certain death when enemies shot his horse. Historian Hugh Dempsey wrote, after she killed an enemy in battle, she was given the man's name, Running Eagle. She was said to have been the only woman in the history of the tribe so honored. Running Eagle joined a warrior society and became a war chief. On the war path, ignoring the objections of her fellow male followers, she cooked and repaired moccasins, stating flatly, I am a woman. Men don't know how to sew. In the 1840s, fur trader John Rowland likely encountered Running Eagle in Cree country. He described, quote, a war party of a thousand men who had at their head the Queen of the Plains. Salish warriors killed Running Eagle during a horse stealing raid in about 1850. Author James Willard Schultz later immortalized her life in his dramatic novel, Running Eagle, The Warrior Girl, a waterfall in Glacier National Park bears her name. Marching through time, uh, the next person I'd like to talk to you about is Jim Beckworth. Jim Beckworth, Jim Beckworth was the Big Sky Country's African-American mountain man extraordinaire. Describing the adventurer and explorer, historian Eleanor Wilson wrote, he was suited to the making of a Western legend. He stood six feet tall, was muscular and strong, quick and lithe. His vitality was remarkable, and his knowledge of Indian ways superb. An educated mulatto, Beckworth was born into slavery about 1798. At 25, he gained his freedom and hired on with the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, ascending the Missouri River to the Rocky Mountains. 
in the West, Beckworth said, there was room to wander without any man to call your steps into question. Montana's Crow Indians adopted Beckworth. He became a warrior and earned the name Bloody Arm for his bravery in battle. In the winter of 1833, trapper Zenas Leonard reported, Beckworth has acquired the Crow manner of living, speaks their language fluently, and has become quite a considerable character in their village. He assumes all the dignities of a chief, for he has four wives with whom he lives alternately. The gold rush lured Beckworth west. There he blazed a popular mountain route to California's gold fields, founded the town of Pueblo, Colorado, and escorted soldiers to the infamous Sand Creek Massacre. Beckworth eventually reappeared in Crow Country and died among his adopted people in 1866. The National Park Service concluded, he was a man who learned to straddle cultures, bridging the traditional divides of race and ethnicity to become one of the most famous frontiersmen in American history. I'm guessing that some of these folks you've heard of before, some maybe not. I have uh, tried to mix it up a little bit to provide uh, a range of individuals, some well-known, some less so, uh, and I've tried to cover what I consider to be some of the key elements in Montana's history, though by no means everything. Um, this is uh, Weijun John, also known as Pigeon's Egghead, or also known as the Light. Weijun John was a young, proud, handsome, and graceful warrior of the Assiniboine people. In 1831, he was invited to travel to Washington, D.C., and thus became one of the first of Montana's Indians to witness the splendor of urban America. Historian Brian Dippy wrote, he was impressionable, curious, and determined to remember what he saw. On his 8,000-mile trek east, Weijun Jean, also known as the Light, beheld the buzzing din of civil life. He toured Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York. He met President Andrew Jackson. Historian John Ewers noted, he was shown the white men's forts, their ocean-going ships, their railroads and balloons, all the material wonders of the white man's civilization. Weijun John returned to Montana on the very first steamboat up the Missouri River. During the long journey, as one passenger observed, he wore an ornate blue uniform and high-heeled boots that, make him, that, that made him step like a yoked hog. He carried a small keg of whiskey under his arm. Weijun John told fantastic tales of his adventure, but his disbelieving people concluded that he was a disturbing disciple of an alien way of life. Artist George Catlin observed, he sank rapidly into disgrace in his tribe and was reputed worthless, the greatest liar of his nation. In 1835, a fellow Assiniboine loaded a musket with the straightened handle of an iron pot and murdered Weijun John. Later, when some St. Louis doctors requested some Indian skulls to study, his head was cut off as corpse and shipped downriver to the civilization that had been the cause of his undoing. I want to talk just for a minute about the painting. Uh, how many of you have seen this painting before? Anybody? This is a very famous uh, George Catlin painting, probably one of his most famous. Catlin was an artist who, about the time of Andrew Jackson's uh, Indian removal policies, decided to document Native American life, in the, especially in the West, but in the Midwest as well. He was on that first steamboat that came up the Missouri and traveled with Weijun John. He had met him on the way back east in St. Louis and painted the first half of this portrait. And then, as a way of comparison, documented what uh, the Assiniboine looked like on his way home. And I think Catlin is making a pretty clear statement here about civilization and its effect on, on Native people. Uh, you can't really tell the story of Montana history, I guess, without talking about Virginia City. And there are a whole heck of a lot of people that possibly could be talked about in a presentation like this, some very interesting folks. Um, because this is a radio show, uh, the sensational tends to be uh, uh, the focus often of my presentations. Uh, not too long ago, I wrote a story about Boone Helm, uh, who was a, a cannibal that was lynched in Virginia City. 
Uh, and uh, uh, this fall, uh, my 10-year-old sons and I took a field trip to Virginia City to go up to Boot Hill and see Boonhelm's grave. My wife was not too crazy about the idea. She stayed in the minivan while we uh, took photos around Boone's grave. But um, th this guy is another example of that kind of sensational Montana history that plays well on the airwaves. Jack Slade was Montana's, Montana's drunken, devilish desperado. Virginia City newspaper man Thomas Dimsdale admitted, from Kearney, Nebraska west, he was feared a great deal more than the Almighty. Born in 1829, Joseph Alfred Jack Slade committed murder and fled west from Illinois. While working on the Overland Trail, he earned the reputation of a first-class fighting man. During a drunken brawl, station master Jules Rennie shot Slade five times, but Slade escaped. Then he returned to torture and kill Rennie, removing his ears, which he carried as souvenirs for the rest of his life. Slade came to Virginia City, Montana in 1863. When sober, he was a soft-spoken and hard-working gentleman. When drunk, Slade became a bloodthirsty ogre, rumored to have killed 26 men. Author Mark Twain called him the pitiless scourge of the outlaws. The raw head and bloody bones the nursing mothers of the mountains terrified their children with. The alcoholic Slade terrorized Virginia City, screaming profanity, trashing saloons, and wildly threatening the citizens. After a particularly violent episode, vigilantes cornered the outlaw and gave him time to write his wife and then hanged him. Before the news, Slade prayed and wept, lamenting over and over, Oh my God, my God, must I die? Oh, my dear wife. Newsman Dimsdale pronounced Slade's hanging the protest of a society on behalf of social order and the rights of man. General Nelson Miles. Uh, the Indian Wars, definitely a big part of Montana's story. Uh, lots of colorful people to talk about. Miles is someone that uh, is, is incredibly significant, I think, and uh, maybe not as well known as some others I could have selected. Uh, Montana's greatest Indian fighter was arguably General Nelson Miles. General William Tecumseh Sherman once admitted, I know of no way to satisfy his ambitions but to surrender to him absolute power of the, over the whole army with president and Congress thrown in. Miles earned a Congressional Medal of Honor in the Civil War and then transferred to Montana to kill Indians and help avenge Custer's death. He believed he was, quote, going to meet the enemies of civilization and that it was a delightful enterprise. General Miles' men built Fort Keogh and were in constant pursuit of the Indians. Author Michael Punk wrote, no one did more to prosecute the Indian wars to their bloody conclusion. Miles fit the total warfare policy like a sword to its scabbard. Miles waged the severest of winter campaigns against thousands of hostile Lakota Sioux in Northern Cheyenne. In 1877, his troops clashed with Crazy Horse at the Battle of Wolf Mountain. They seized hundreds of horses, teepees, and most of the Sioux food supply. Crazy Horse soon gave up. Then Miles intercepted Chief Joseph's Nez Perce band just 40 miles from Canada. Years later, he accepted Geronimo's surrender. Miles boasted, I have fought and defeated larger and better armed body, uh, bodies of hostile Indians than any other officer since the history of Indian warfare commenced. Historian Elliot West called him a preening chest puffer, relentlessly and insufferably self-serving. Miles eventually became commanding general of the army. He died of a heart attack at a Ringling Brothers Circus in 1925. Montana's Miles City bears his name. Lots of powerful capitalists in Montana's history. And uh, I really debated uh, on who to talk about. But for, for sheer colorful copy, I don't think that there's anyone that, that fits this, the, the goal of the radio show more than uh, James J. Hill. 
James J. Hill was a scrappy, hot-tempered Canadian nicknamed the Empire Builder. Historian Stuart Holbrook characterized him as the barbed wire, shaggy-headed, one-eyed old son of a bitch of Western railroading. <laughs> Hill sensed that Montana's abundant resources could support a second transcontinental line, the Great Northern Railway. He bragged, give me enough Swedes and whiskey and I'll build a railroad through hell. Hill's 9,000 workers invaded Montana Territory on June 13, 1887. Covering as many as seven miles a day, they raced up the Missouri and Milk River Valleys. Writer Charles Dudley Wag Warner gushed, those who saw this army of men and teams stretching over the prairies and clashing up this continental highway think that they beheld one of the most striking achievement achievements of civilization. By November, Hill's crew had reached Helena and laid 643 continuous miles of track in just seven and a half months. By 1893, the Great Northern had linked St. Paul to Seattle. No railroad had ever been built so rapidly. Historian Mike Malone described the Great Northern as one of the best constructed and most profitable of the world's major railroads. It was the first transcontinental built without public money and one of the few to never go bankrupt. When we were all dead and gone, Hill once said, the sun will still shine, the rain will fall, and this railroad will run as usual. Lots of cowboys to pick from as well in Montana history. Um, one of the most colorful writers was this guy. Edward Charles Teddy Blue Abbott, who uh, rode the Chisholm Trail uh, from Texas into Nebraska when he was just 10 years old, which is pretty incredible. Uh, Montana seldom saw a range rider as colorful as Teddy Blue Abbott. Biographer Helena Huntington Smith described the legendary cowboy as tough as a whipcord and boiling with energy. He was the history of the cattle trail in the open range. Born in England, Edward Charles Abbott came to the United States in 1871. At just 10 years old, he helped drive a herd of Texas cattle to Nebraska. He said it made a cowboy out of me. Nothing could have changed me after that. Abbott recalled, the cattle run wild while the men was away fighting the Civil War. Here was all these cheap, longhorn steers overrunning Texas. Here was the rest of the country crying out for beef and no railroads to get them out. So they trailed them out. From that time on, the big drives were made every year, and the cowboy was born. During the heyday of the open range, Abbott drove Longhorns north from Texas to Montana. In his 1930s memoir, We Pointed Them North, he described stampedes, vicious 50 degree below zero snowstorms, and getting knocked off his horse by lightning twice. Abbott later settled down to raise a family on a ranch near Lewistown, Montana. Summing up his colorful life, he said, Only a few of us are now left, and they are scattered from Texas to Canada. The rest have gone ahead across the big divide. I hope they find good water and plenty of grass. But wherever they are is where I want to go. Nanny Alderson um, is very representative, I think, of women's experiences in the homesteading era and uh, someone that, is, um, uh, that has left a, a, a memoir which is really helpful in getting to understand that experience. Nanny Alderson and her husband Walt rode the rails to Miles City, Montana in 1883. The newlyweds homesteaded on Lame Deer Creek hoping to quickly capitalize on the beef bonanza and then return east. In her memoir, A Bride Grows West, Alderson recalled, at first we didn't mind the hard things because we didn't expect them to last. Montana was booming and the same feverish optimism possessed all of us. It looked so easy and we could figure it all out. In no time, we all would be cattle kings. Alderson's hopes soon faded. In the spring of 1884, the very day her first baby was born, Northern Cheyenne warriors burned the Alderson cabin as punishment for unwittingly trespassing on reservation lands. 
Alderson recalled it was then that she began to pioneer in earnest, no longer borne up by the belief that our trials were temporary. The Aldersons relocated to the Tongue River. Those years were, in Nanny's words, the hardest of my life, for I had nothing to cling to. You had to keep up or go under, and keeping up made such hard work. Ten years after coming west to get rich, the Aldersons abandoned ranching and moved to Miles City. Summing up their travails and those of their contemporaries, author William Bevis observed, it was a beginning for Montana that finally rewarded not dreams of open space where a poor man can grow rich, but endurance. And then there's Butte. What do you say about Butte? Uh, <laughs> that's tough. Um, I uh, had the pleasure for a few years of uh, working on the National Historic Landmark designation uh, for Butte. I was the chief historian on that project and uh, fell in love with the place. Uh, my wife's uh, family on her dad's side uh, is from Butte. Uh, one of, he, he used to tell stories at Thanksgiving, you know, after he'd had a glass of wine or two about growing up in Butte. Uh, and uh, one of his first earliest memories, he was probably three years old or something like that, was his older brother clinging to a chain link fence during a, a strike, screaming, you goddamn scabs. Um, <clears throat> he told stories about dribbling a basketball home and, uh, on a rainy day and how the rainwater had so much acid in it that he would have blisters on his hands uh, by the time he got home. And, um, and so uh, Butte became a place of fascination for me. And there's an awful lot that can be said about Butte. I've tried to narrow it down to just two personalities, one who you probably know and one perhaps who you don't. How many of you have heard of Mary McLean before? Yeah. She is so outrageous. And uh, her writing is so colorful that it really lends itself well to a, a minute 36 seconds on the radio. Uh, here we go. Mary McLean was the wild woman of Butte. Born in 1881, McLean was raised in Butte, Montana. She called it a pungent little place that devours feminine youth with the jaws of a monstrous, insatiate demon. In 1902, at age 19, McLean published The Story of Mary McLean. In it, she openly discussed her hunger for fame, her bisexual passions, even her desire to marry the devil. McLean confessed, my head broke out in brains and I wrote my wail of adolescence. The mainstream press was horrified, but McLean quickly sold 100,000 copies. Anthologist Elizabeth Pruitt wrote, she captured the fancy of millions, was elevated to near mythic status in her own time, was gossiped about incessantly, imitated constantly, and condemned mercilessly. McLean took her royalties to Greenwich Village. There she lived a decadent bohemian life as a journalist, gambler, and prize fight reporter. She wrote and starred in her own silent movie, Men Who Have Made Love to Me, then faded into obscurity. Asked what would happen if she ever reached the age of 25, a young McLean boasted, I don't care, but I shall not be forgotten. I am one of the great ones of Earth. When at 48, McLean died penniless, a Jazz Age magazine, the Chicagoan, remembered her as the first of the self-expressionists, the first of the flappers. Another Butte personality who uh, I've grown uh, quite interested in is Lewis Duncan. How many of you have heard of Mr. Duncan before? Yeah, an interesting fellow. He was honest, he was fearless, because he stood for what was right, he was persecuted, he was maligned, he was ousted from office. That's Butte Mayor Charles Howsworth describing the city's former mayor, Lewis Duncan, a socialist. In 1911, Butte, Montana's Gibraltar of Unionism, became one of the largest American cities ever governed by socialists. Their leader was Lewis Duncan a prominent Unitarian minister and Shakespearean scholar. Also had quite the fashion sense, I think. <clears throat> he died in 
He called on Butte's workers to cast a class-conscious ballot and unite on the political field under a socialist banner. Duncan started successfully. Lewistown's Montana News called him a great favorite with the Union men of Montana and a splendid orator. The Missoulian wrote, Duncan has managed that unruly city with remarkable skill until today, even, the political, even his political enemies admit openly, if reluctantly, that his administration is the best that Butte ever had. But in 1914, rioters destroyed the Butte Miners Union. The powerful amalgamated copper company charged Duncan and his supporters with a spirit of fanaticism and hatred for American institutions. Pro-company Judge Roy Ayers found Duncan guilty of tolerating lawlessness and not doing enough to protect property. The mayor was impeached and removed from office, to which Duncan declared, Today, my political scalp decorates the wigwam of the amalgamated, but my record is clean and my spirit is unquenched. I have been ousted, not because I neglected my duty, but because I had the courage, courage to act by a higher principle than is approved by the capitalist class. I have regarded human life as of greater value than property. Uh, I sort of have a crush on Maggie Smith Hathaway. Uh, she's someone I've just gotten to know recently and um, really found, find her to be quite an impressive person. Great representative of what we would call the progressive era in Montana history. Maggie Smith Hathaway was Montana's champion of women. As Helena's first female county superintendent of schools, she demanded equal pay for male and female school employees in 1905. The red-headed and feisty Hathaway then went on to fight for women's suffrage and temperance. As one of the first two women elected to the Montana House of Representatives in 1916, she declared, we hope to do much good for the women and children of the state. In the State House, the persistent Hathaway was nicknamed Mrs. Has Her Way. She pushed for an eight hour workday for women, introduced a law to compel men to care for their abandoned children, strengthened the mother's pension law, and pressed for a federal women's suffrage amendment. Headlines across the nation read Montana woman wins fame by having many state bills passed. One legislator admitted, She's the biggest man in the house, yet she only weighs but 115 pounds. During World War I, Hathaway vowed to serve as an example for the patriotic women of Montana. She then proceeded to run her 600-acre manless ranch near Stevensville with an all-female crew, declaring, I am not ashamed of any honest labor done with my head or my hands. I have little use for a lazy person and very little respect for a non-producer. During her three-term tenure, Hathaway, a Democrat, rose to become minority floor leader, a national first for women. She later served as the first woman secretary of the Montana Bureau of Child Protection. Hathaway died in 1955 at age 89. One nice thing about writing uh, these two-minute snippets of history is that you don't have to hang out with these people for that long if you don't want to. You know, whereas if you're writing an article or a book, you might invest years of your life uh, staying with these people. Um, and in some cases, I think I would like to get to know them better. In other cases, perhaps not so much. And uh, this guy might be an example of the latter. This is Senator Henry Myers of Montana. And prior to um, my getting involved with this project, I, I knew nothing about Myers. I'd never heard of him before. He's an interesting fellow. The grandfather of hysterical anti-communist crusades was two-term Democratic Senator Henry Myers of Montana. Author Robert Murray called him a most vociferous anti-radical spokesman. Born in Missouri, Myers moved to Hamilton, Montana in 1893. Voters sent him to the U.S. Senate in 1911. During World War I, he was swept up in what historian Kurt Wetzel called the emotional wartime burst of patriotic fervor that engulfed Montana and made loyalty a high priority. Myers saw labor unions as hotbeds of socialism. 
He branded them the greatest menace facing this country today. After the Russian Revolution, Myers predicted, unless the Congress suppresses labor unrest, the nation will see a Soviet government set up within two years' time. Myers helped lead America into its first Red Scare. He declared, we whip the Redskins to obtain possession of this country. We whip the Red Coats to achieve its independence. And we must not let the Red Hearted and Red Handed overthrow it. Down the Reds has been our practice. It should now be our motto. Foreshadowing the Cold War accusations of Senator Joseph McCarthy, Myers warned, this country is reeking and seething with the machinations of disloyalty, sedition, and Bolshevism. Their proponents are becoming bold. They have defenders and sympathizers in high places. By the time he left the U.S. Senate in 1923, Montana's fear-mongering anti-communist champion had condemned Hollywood and even his own political party. Uh, I'm a graduate of Montana State University. and. Uh, since we're in neutral territory here and not uh, west of the divide, uh, I thought perhaps uh, I, would, I would throw in a university story. And this one has a personal, um, a personal connection for me. When I was growing up, when my family first moved to Montana, I was 10, and uh, we lived in Gallatin Canyon, about six miles north of present Big Sky. And uh, this man here, Max Worthington, was our next door neighbor. And he kind of took me under his arm, taught me how to fish, uh, and uh, um, was really an incredible guy. He was a member of this, uh, this basketball team, and later became uh, associated with MSU, uh, was a dean down there for a long time. Did any of you know Max? He's a real gentleman. And uh, uh, today, uh, uh, in the field house down in Bozeman, Worthington Arena is named for Max. In the 1920s, Bozeman's Montana State Golden Bobcats were college basketball's wonder team. Sports writer Rail Cummings described them as perfectly suited for the jazz age, stylish and frenetic. The Golden Bobcats pioneered the fast break, gaining national attention with their thrilling full court passes and snappy backward tosses. Historian Ellis Roberts Perry noted they revolutionized the game by averaging over 60 points per game when most teams at the time scored in the high 20s or low 30s. The Miami News dubbed the Montana, Montana State the point and a half per minute team, adding, this seems like about the human maximum unless a couple of howitzers are installed to fire the shots. Standouts Cat Thompson, Brick Breeden, and Max Worthington racked up a 102 to 11 record between 1926 and 1929. Their aggressive style of racehorse basketball won the Golden Bobcats three state Rocky Mountain Conference titles. One year, they outscored their opponents by more than 1,000 points to become collegiate national champions. One sports writer noted, all Montana was nuts about their Bobcats, and so was the nation. Tremendous crowds paid fantastic prices for tickets to see them perform their feats with a basketball. The Helms Athletic Foundation voted the 1929 Golden Bobcats college basketball's top team for the first half of the 20th century. They are enshrined today in MSU's Athletic Hall of Fame, Brick Breeden Fieldhouse, and Max Worthington Arena. Brick Breeden, uh, yeah, right, Breeden was also on this team, yeah. And uh, Worthington is the guy that I mentioned. And I, who, which one is, uh, yeah, Worthington is three and from the top. Breeden, I'm not, does anyone know? Three from the left. From the left, okay, so. Just a couple more, folks, and then I'll be happy to take some questions. Uh, Bob Marshall, uh, um, just someone that I've admired for a long time um, and thought he would fit with this, uh, this presentation. If ever there was a man for whom a wilderness should be named, it was Bob Marshall. The Forest Service assigned the 24-year-old Marshall to Missoula's Northern Rocky Mountain Experiment Station. There he regularly explored Montana's backcountry on marathon 30 to 40 mile a day hikes and concluded, 
wilderness is melting away like some last snowbank on some south-facing mountainside during a hot afternoon in June. In the years that followed, historian Roderick Nash observed that Marshall became a legend in his own time, prodigious hiker, explorer of the Earth's far corners, best-selling author, millionaire, PhD, one of the most colorful figures in forest history. In his time, most Americans saw the land as merely a supplier of natural resources. For Marshall, it was much more. He wrote, in a world overrun by split-second schedules, physical certainty, and man-made superficiality, it is necessary to preserve a certain precious value of the timeless, the mysterious, and the primordial. In Marshall's view, the enjoyment of solitude, complete independence, and the beauty of undefiled panoramas is absolutely essential to happiness. While the Forest Service Chief of Recreation and Lands, Marshall added 5.4 million acres to the nation's wilderness system. In 1934, he helped found the Wilderness Society for the purpose of fighting off the invasion of wilderness and of stimulating appreciation of its emotional, intellectual, and scientific values. Marshall's convictions were strong, but his heart was weak. He died in 1939 at just 38. Two years later, the federal government created one of the first designated wilderness areas in the nation, Montana's Million Acre Bob Marshall Wilderness. Another Montana senator that I really didn't know before I started this project was uh, James Murray. And uh, there's a lot that I could say about Murray. He is the author of both the Alaska and the Hawaii statehood bills, among other things. Uh, but I was really drawn to his role uh, during World War II and his uh, efforts to help uh, European Jews. Um, while most Americans remained silent during Hitler's Holocaust, Democratic U.S. Senator James Murray of Montana spoke out in defense of the Jews. Historian Raphael Medoff wrote, Murray had little to gain and much to lose by taking an interest in rescuing European Jewish refugees, who then constituted barely one-third of one percent of Montana's population. Prior to Pearl Harbor, most Montanans were isolationists. Burton K. Wheeler, the state's influential senior senator, campaigned against intervention. Others, like Republican Congressman Jacob Thorkelson, railed against communistic Jews and Jewish international financiers from the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. But Murray, defying all political logic, condemned Hitler as a ruthless, dangerous maniac. He was among the first in Washington to condemn the Holocaust, calling it a terrible problem which has too long been evaded. FDR's preference was rescue through victory. But Murray demanded saving the helpless Jews of Europe who were facing, quote, a purposeful annihilation on a scale the world has never seen. He warned, we dare not wait any longer, for every day of postponement means death to thousands of innocent victims. If we wait until the war is won, there may be only corpses left to enjoy victory. Murray helped convince FDR to establish the War Refugee Board, liberating 200,000 Jews in the final months of the war. Then Murray again took the lead, advocating for a free and democratic Jewish state in Palestine. In 1948, the United Nations General Assembly approved the creation of the modern state of Israel. And the last uh, person I'd like to talk about, uh, someone who just recently passed, Eloise Cabell. Commenting on Blackfoot elder activist Eloise Cabell's groundbreaking legal challenge on behalf of Native peoples everywhere, the Great Falls Tribune predicted, she will go down in history as the woman who won recognition and respect for her people and who had been cheated by the federal government since the late 1800s. She was the great granddaughter of famed warrior Mountain Chief and grew up on Montana's Blackfeet Reservation. As the tribe's treasurer, Cabell, also known as Yellow Bird Woman, uncovered, quote, a shocking pattern of deception. The U.S. government had underpaid Indian nations billions in royalties for oil, gas, timber, and grazing leases. She said, it's just such a wrong that if I don't do something about it, I'm as criminal as the government. In 1996, Cabell filed one of the largest class action lawsuits ever. 
After 15 years of grueling litigation, she and her attorneys won a $3.4 billion settlement benefiting nearly 300,000 Native Americans. Judge Royce Lamberth called the case a story shot through with bureaucratic blunders and peppered with scandals, dirty tricks, and outright villainy. Cabell said, I never started this case with any intentions of being a hero. I just wanted to give justice to people that didn't have it. Cabell had given up her post as president of Montana's Elvis Presley fan club to pursue the lawsuit. When she died in October of 2011, she was buried with a rosary, a braid of sweet grass, and an Elvis doll. Uh, a writer, a Montana history writer that I really like is a guy by the name of Joseph Kinsey Howard. And uh, Howard once said that Montana has lived the life of America on a reduced scale and at a breakneck speed. Its history has been bewilderingly condensed, a kaleidoscopic newsreel, unplotted and unplanned. Um, I would like to think that these little snippets of history that the Montana Medicine Show has, has produced are an expression of what maybe Joseph Kinsey Howard is talking about here. That it's possible to distill down Montana history into digestible little segments that are, are I think, potent and meaningful. And if we can com connect the dots somehow, um, I think we get a bird's eye view of Montana history that is, is perhaps greater than um, looking at each of these stories individually. So thanks for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. I'd be happy to answer some questions if you have any.